consider yourself an empath? Have you ever dealt with energy vampires or been under psychic attack? This is Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys Radio. And on this week's show, my special guest is psychic counselor, Lisa Campion. We're gonna talk about her new book, Energy Healing for Empaths. We've also got coach extraordinaire, Shana James. It all begins on KCAA Radio in Southern California at 8 p.m. Pacific time, 102.3, 106.5 FM, 1050 AM, the podcast and my YouTube drop tomorrow. Guys, guys, radio, thanks for your support. Okay, do you think you're an empath or maybe even an energy vampire? Do you know how to honor your boundaries and protect yourselves? Well, if so, we've got the special guest for you on Guys Guys Radio today. She's the very lovely Lisa Campion, and she is terrific. She's got a new book out. It's called Energy Healing for Empaths. And she's also uh, author of the number one best-selling book, The Art of Psychic Reiki. And she's a Reiki master teacher. And uh, she's a psychic counselor also. And she's got 25 years of experience. She's been teaching Reiki for over 20 years. And if you're not familiar with Reiki, it's something you, everybody wants to learn more and more about because it's spreading around the world very quickly. I'm a Reiki master teacher myself. And one of the most wonderful things about Reiki is that you can treat yourself, which is awesome. It's like you really can't, you can give yourself a little bit of massage, but you can give yourself a full Reiki treatment. So Lisa's been teaching for over 20 years. She's trained more than a thousand people in Reiki. And she's conducted more than 15,000 individual sessions, which is amazing. She also is the host of the radio show, The Miracle of Healing on Empower Radio. And she specializes in uh, training emerging psychics, empaths, healers, so they can fully develop their gifts. And there's so many people who are ascending now and kind of coming out and realizing that everybody has some type of empathic gifts. And people, a lot of people aren't sure, oh, what do I do now? And they're afraid of their gifts. So great guest lisa campion back on guys guys radio welcome lisa great to see you oh great to see you too robert thank you so much for having me back on guys guys radio you got it and uh, the new book is called the healing for empaths so let's start right at the beginning for our listeners because i'm not sure everybody is familiar with exactly what an empath is or if they may be an empath or not so let's start right there uh what is an empath are we all empaths to some degree and and how, how are we different in terms of uh, empaths that are on a really psychic, um, uh, spiritual enfoldment path and others that are just kind of sensitive people that are not, are, are not aware that they're empaths? Yeah. Yeah. So an empath is, is really, um, you know, we, we all have the, uh, the capacity to feel empathy or I assume that we all do. Really, some people don't. But um, and, and that's sort of like different from being an empath. So we all can relate maybe to feeling like, oh, I, I see that that person's sad and I feel bad about that. But an empath is a little different. An empath is like a psychic sponge. And what they do is they actually absorb the emotion, energy, thought, feeling um, of other people and they experience those feelings as if it's your feeling. So you might sit down next to somebody who's having a bad day and, and not just notice they're having a bad day. All of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I feel so sad. I feel so depressed. I'm so, I feel so heavy. Wah! You know, and it, what's going on is you're absorbing what's the energy from that person and you're experiencing it as if it's your feeling. That's really the difference. Now, for the for the day to day person, like recently, I've been taking a spiritual, I've been attending spiritual enfoldment class for about three years. And normally, you know, I watch the news and I don't really get too, uh, 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 you know, attached to it. I see it for what I witness it. Yet I was watching all the information uh, coming out about Texas and all those poor people, like mm -hmm. with the water and the frozen water and just the horrible conditions they're dealing with right now. And actually, could like almost feel it. So for everyday people, if they're on kind of a spiritual path, if you will, can we become more empathic? Yes, I I think that empaths like our old souls, so people who are born as empaths and empath, and they're it's like a, a character thing that we're born with part of our personality and even part of our soul mission here um they're old souls and um just like you're an old soul you know robert and and we as we do spiritual development work we become more empathic and the empaths really feel in their they know in every fiber of their being that we as human humans are all interconnected and i can't hurt me without hurting you and i couldn't hurt you without hurting me and we're and all the plants and animals on the planet are interconnected into one web of existence that's well that's a normal thing for us we know that so of course mm -hmm. you're going to feel you're going to feel 
you know, compassion. Compassion is a is a common emotional state for empaths. Or we okay. feel plugged into the pain and suffering of humanity and we suffer. You know, now, we feel like, be... like ahead. horrible, I'm like, sorry. oh my God, and this year has been a really hard year for empaths because there's so much pain and suffering. There's so much, um, you know, just that turmoil that we really feel deeply. And that's where, that's kind of where I was going because 2020 was tough and 2021, you know, the dates, the dates change, but the issues are still out there. So was it a very tough year last year and going through everything with everybody's going through and the news is so negative nowadays and understandably so in a lot of ways, because the planet has a lot of problems. How does that affect empaths like yourself and other people that you work with? Well, I think empath. so the first part of the lockdown was sort of fun for, for us empaths because mostly we're introverted, you know, and um, we like to be home alone. <laughs> we like to be quiet and like shutting down the world, um, you know, tune, dialing out from that whole thing. Empaths are like, thank God, the world sort of slowed down to a speed in a, in a tempo that empaths really like, I, I have no problem not leaving my house for six weeks, you know, um, and now, and now we're at the point where we're just sort of saturated by the suffering. You know, there's no nowhere to go where you can't, you know, you don't feel the impact of what we've been through. Um, and I think the flip side, the flip side of it is that uh, empaths are really to be healers, helpers, and caregivers. So we're we are more and more people are being called to feel like they want to be healers, or just helping people out. Like, and it might be as simple as smiling at somebody in the grocery store or when now we smile over our masks we have to do the eye smile that's right you know right. <laughs> no, but <laughs> i'm like smiling at you through my eyes if you can't see that's it so you know? funny. <laughs> i'm doing that all the time but um so we you know we are the person like an empath goes into the supermarket and 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 somebody will just come up to you randomly and tell you their life story in the middle of the super some random strangers tell you their life story because they can feel how compassionate you are and how you basically have the soul of a healer too. Wow. And, and there's so much opportunity now that we have to help people. So another uh, concept in the book and the name of the book is the energy, energy healing for empaths, um, how to protect yourself from energy vampires, honoring your boundaries and building healthy relationships. So the other side of the coin is the energy vampire. So what is an energy vampire and how do they kind of threaten, if you will, empaths? I think we can divide people sort of, I mean, this is, this is a simplistic idea, but we can sort of divide people into two categories, givers and takers, right? And the empaths tend to be givers. You know, we, we give our energy and energy vampires are the takers of the world. And we, um, another way to look at them is uh, energy vampires are narcissists, you know, and Empaths and narcissists are on the their sort of polarity or continuum there, and we often are drawn into relation as sensitive people, drawn into relationship with um, energy vampires. They just, they don't know how to give; they really just want to take. And the, if we can manage this, you know, um, the high side of this, there's healing for both parties. There's potential for healing. That empath may uh, an encounter with an energy vampire will force an empath to get better balance. So they sort of start take, standing up for themselves. And the possibility for the empire is that they might become more empathic, they might start really caring about how people feel, or they are people who need healing and are drawn to the healing nature of the empath. So, so I think uh, with narcissists, whatever you know about narcissists, you can sort of apply to energy, energy vampires. So I've got to think that the pig and the python for all this is a lot of everyday people that probably have a little bit of both inside of them. And then the challenge is yeah. how do we manage our inner energy vampire and our empathy because you know sometimes you get on a phone call with somebody at the end of it you're just like wow i feel drained and they yeah. at the end of the call they say i feel great great talk speaking with you and you're like mm -hmm. i wish i agreed exactly and we all have people like that that drain us that and that's sort of the nature i mean most people don't know they're an energy vampire it's not like you know, like I woke up today and said, how can I drain the heck out of Robert today? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess some people do think that, but most people, most of us don't. And so we can all fall into the habit of becoming an energy vampire if we don't understand how to manage our boundaries, how to replenish our, you know, keep our energy tanks full. And some of the worst offenders are empaths who let themselves get so drained by other people that they're just de now desperate. Okay, um, how can uh, the everyday person 
um, identify energy vampires that they're interfacing with. It could be a family member, it could be somebody at work, it could be strangers on the street or just dealing with somebody in day-to-day -day affairs. So what should yeah. we look for? Well, I think what you said about feeling drained is a, you know, a big red flag. If you feel a lot of resentment when that person comes around, the phone rings and you're like, oh boy, that person, you know, um, you want to watch that. People will have, if you're in person with somebody, you'll have the tendency to want to cross your arms across your solar plexus because from, you know, because I'm a Reiki practitioner and an energy healer, I look at the way, I look at how this functions on the human energy field through, the, through our aura and stuff like that. But what I see is the energy vampire will hook you like energetically into the solar plexus and feel naturally like we want to cover that part of us when energy vampires are around. So it's sort of that combination of drain and dread and resentment that um, would make us, you know, avoid people. Okay. Would do that to us. Our special guest on Guys Guys Radio, Lisa Campion, her new book is Energy Healing for Empaths. So um, do you think there's kind of an over... Uh, an overarching uh, energy vampire uh, template going on in our culture nowadays with the news media, et cetera, where people are being kind of drained. I noticed like I was watching, uh, when watching the Super Bowl and I, my career has been in advertising and I felt I was assaulted by the ads. They were just too many quick cuts, too many like uh, gags. And it was like, whoa, this is like assaultive just watching regular TV. Um, mm. is, it, is this part of the media, part of society, the government even? I mean, are we getting assaulted? Oh, yeah. Are we getting our energy drained purposely Absolutely. through fear? Yes, on so many levels, through fear. And I, I do believe we live in a time when narcissists and energy vampires are celebrated, where, you know, are rewarded for being that way. And you can kind of look at our celebrity culture mm -hmm. um, as the selfie culture and like, look at me, look at me, look at me. No. Um, and they, they're... I don't know how much of those people are actually contributing. <laughs> you know, like if you think about givers or takers, you know, there's there's a lot of reward for the takers in the world right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Okay. You talk about uh, in the book empathic overload. What are some signs of that? And what is like overgiving and being too nice? So because uh, empaths need some type of self protection, or are they going to just get drained? Yeah. Yeah. It's totally our nature to give, give, give. Like, we really care. We really have been compassionate hearts. And we can feel how much somebody's suffering or how much they need. So it's it's so um, easy to overgive. If somebody's like, oh, my God, Lisa, I'm so desperate for help. And I'm like, oh, I can feel it. And I want to give, you know. And for, there's so many ways that I've had to learn how to hold my boundary. And one of them is just through, again, because I'm an energy healer, understanding my energy field and knowing that I need to not be a sponge. I need to be a more like a, have a solid, you know, bubble around me. Um, and it's all about learning about a hundred different ways to set boundaries. So you, you could be doing it with your energy mm -hmm. field. You could be doing it just by saying no, people. I sometimes use my phone and my technology as an ally to set the boundary. I t turn my phone off. I don't answer, you know, like we can use technology to c create boundaries. But I think that it's thinking about all the ways that we need to, we're not very good at it. Sensitive people feel we feel, it feels mean to set a boundary. Do you, uh, can we like uh, just uh, conceptualize a protective bubble around ourselves, whether it's our vehicle or we're walking down the street or we're dealing with certain people uh, before we know we're going to get into situations that make us uncomfortable or people that make us uncomfortable? I mean, is that something, what, what can the uh, lay person do to protect themselves from energy vampires? Yeah, that's a, um, that's a really powerful thing to do a visualization visualize your sh shields on full you know or um i my son was sort of a you know star trek fan so he would like space shield up you know and he would do that <laughs> way and or put you know put him inside an armored car mm -hmm. um sometimes i use the image of like the the, the space suits the astronauts because <laughs> they you know that can they can go anywhere nothing can get through them and that because our aura, our energy field responds really well to our visualizations, that really works. We need to stop being a sponge and we need to start having a boundary. A boundary means that when I say no to you, I'm saying yes to myself. And I think the other thing is we need to learn some really polite ways to say no and practice. Them. You know, okay. so when somebody asks you on the fly, you can you can say no. Oh, I, 
I'm not really sure. Let me get back to you. Let me check my calendar. I'll get back to you tomorrow is kind of my go-to. Uh, do you think that uh, energy workers and people who are ascending nowadays, are they under more uh, psychic attacks and are they purpose on purpose? Um, I don't know if it's more. That is an interesting question. I mean, I've been doing energy work and psychic work for so long for people, and it constantly amazes me how much um, purposeful negative energy. I used to not believe in curses or black magic or anything like that until I would see it over and over again um, where, where there's just a whole host. In fact, I teach a psychic protection class, several psychic protection classes for empaths. Um, and for healers, because it's such a big problem, we're so open. If, if you think we're open and unboundaried, then we can be a magnet for um, intrusion, invasion, whether whether it's from other people, whether it's from the environments that we occupy, or whether it's from spirit, spirits, actually. Can be. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, it is a thing, for sure. Now, some people, I know myself, for a long time, I used to get drained because I, I would pick up everybody's psychic garbage and i wasn't doing it on purpose but ha working with some people who do the type of work you do lisa i learned that i was collecting stuff that i didn't want and then i kind of learned how to not be so vulnerable that way what can people do uh who, who are prone to feel that they are collecting too much uh energy from other people or being drained from other people yeah yeah well if you think about uh an empath has an energy field like a sponge instead of like a bubble called psychic sponges. The two problems are leak energy, which will make you exhausted, clogged with goo. So clearing practices are really important today. You know, I do a ground, clear, protect breathing, you know, thing where you, you breathe yourself into your body like you ground. Empaths tend to pop out of our body when we feel weird. So you got to ground yourself down. You've got to um, uh, squeeze a sponge. If you're, think of yourself as a psychic sponge, where you've got to squeeze. I use a Technique to just drop, you know, take a really deep inhale, run it through my belly and my heart and drop it down my legs and out the bottoms of my feet and then reset my shield. But also things like exercise, breathing, swimming, water, a, a tub, getting in the salt water, getting in the ocean is incredibly powerful. So that combination of water and salt, um, even walking on the beach can be, a, you know, you'll know things that clear your energy. Um, because you're going to feel clear when, after you've done done it. And I also wanted to just um, put a little shout out because this is Guy's Guy Radio. Sure. Um, that empath, there are just as my uh, um, opinion and experience, just as many empathic men as there are empathic women. And we can have this myth that it's only women that are empaths, but I don't see that at all. And I think that empathic men have a much more difficult time more than women who are empaths because there's so much programming against being sensitive for men that's true. what do you think Rob, about know, I, that, I i agree with you completely but uh the good news is i think more and more men are opening up and they're having to deal with how do i how do i navigate this but the good news is they continue to do so and it's going to happen more and more and i think the stigma is more for you know the boomer guys as the, as the yeah. younger guys are more open they're not thinking in the same terms in terms of gender roles and expectations right. everything's kind of changed and that that's a good thing because now is the time for the you know women have been in a long uh they're finally being recognized and they've been on a very straight trajectory for the past 50 years or so and that's a really good thing and guys are a little bit confused right now and guys can get stuck but um mm -hmm. the good news is guys are now guys are starting to open up and saying hey you know what about us what can we do and that's a, that's a really good thing and it's a good way to channel their energy because there is some confusion out there amongst guys as to what the rec what the expectations are for them and how do they define themselves and you know for boomers it's like here's my wallet and here's my job and for the young guys it's like it's i'm somewhere between the mma and manscaping and i'm not sure what i'm supposed to be so it's a very right. challenging thing so that's a great question now we, yeah. i'll switch back and i'll i'll interview you again <laughs> So well, you talk about situational energy vampires. What, is, uh, what, are, what does that mean? Well, I mean, I think we can all fa fall on hard times, and certainly the past 12 months has been an example of that, right? And a situational vampire is just a normal person who doesn't have vampire tendencies, who becomes an energy vampire because they're just going through something really difficult. We have a job loss, an illness, a divorce, 
a pandemic, <laughs> you know, like whatever, all of the stuff we've got. And that puts you really in a in, in a bad place where you don't have your re the resources that you have to kind of bolster yourself up. And um, and we, we've all gone through times like that where we and we we can become very needy and pulling on the people that are around us. It's like you're drowning and you're, you know, you're grabbing onto the people around <laughs> you trying to stay afloat. Right. <laughs> So how can yeah. some, on that on that point, how does somebody how can we all check in with ourselves and say, hey, you know what, maybe I'm being an energy vampire in this situation. How do we kind of check ourselves? Well, I think I think in, a, in an ideal world, we want our relationships to have like sort of 50 50 give and take over time. You know, like if you if you check in over a year with a friend or, you know, loved one that you are giving as much as you're taking over that time. And so if you're in a a place where you're really desperate and you're taking money out of the bank and you know energetically with that person when you when you're back on your feet you want to make sure you're giving energy to them and you know people who are in a crisis they call you on the phone and they talk for an hour and they're like what? and then they never even ask you about you you mm -hmm. know but we could change that if we had an hour conversation even if you're in a crisis you could talk for half an hour and use the other half an hour to be like well how are you robert tell me about what's going on in your life thank you for listening to me you know because i i think we want to try to be conscious about our energy exchange with other people okay um what do you want um you know it's interesting the book is called uh, energy healing for empaths but i read it and I feel that it's for everybody, and that's why I want to have you on the show. It's not specifically, it, you know, it's targeted towards real empaths, but I think there's tips in there that we all need to know because energy vampires are everywhere. We have yes. to protect our energy. We have to ground ourselves. We have to do breathing exercises. So it's really got a lot of tips, a lot of everything. What do you want? Who's the, who in your, when you wrote the book, who did you think it was for? And now that it's out there, what do you want people to get out of it? Well, like I said, I really felt like, um, energy vampire and uh, empath is a continuum, you know, like, a, like, and I wanted to sort of speak to every point on that continuum. Like, what do you do if you're more on the empathic side? How do you deal with the people who are the takers? And also, what do you do if you know, because like, um, I, I do radio shows like this, you know, and I, I um, contact from people who are like, I heard you talk about energy vampires. I think I'm an energy vampire. What do I do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what do, how do I not be that way? You know, um, and I was so surprised that that conversation was happening. Um, and, and I was so excited, actually, to, to have that. And so I think we just need to be mindful. We need to learn how to source our own energy. Because when we're unconscious of this, we steal energy from other people all the time because we don't know better. We don't know another way to do it. And so we have to learn everybody, empaths, energy vampires, people in the middle, people like you said that have one foot in each. We have to learn how to fill our own energy tanks from other sources. Maybe it's through spiritual practice. Maybe it's through exercise, fitness, food, sleep, like, or doing the things that we love. To, you know, the things that put the gas back in your tank, right? Okay. You know, it's walking on the beach or playing with your son or, you know, um, just doing nothing. I don't know. Like, you know, I have my things, you have your things. We have to have those in our life in an unapologetic way because we cannot give from an empty cup. And when we do, we've got problems. Great. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Lisa Campion, tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and where they can get the book. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Come by my website, lisacampion.com. I'd love to visit. I have actually a lot of free resources there for um, free, all kinds of free material on this topic if you visit there. And you can get my book at any, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You Please visit your local bookstore and, and support them. Um, they'll, they'll have it. Any local Barnes & Noble or sort of new agey bookstore has my book right now. Fantastic. So Lisa Campion, just so your listeners know, it's C-A-M-P-I-O-N. And uh, she's a big Tom Brady fan also, right? I am a big Tom Brady fan. <laughs> <laughs> died in the world, lived in New England my whole life. And I'm happy for him down there in Florida. You know, I think he deserves it, but we're all a little sad up here. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Great to have you back on the show. We'll see you again. Thanks, Robert. Okay, Guys Guys Radio, special guest. Uh, we're going to go into the... Uh, the coaching lane now, uh, the show originally started with relationship coaches. So I, I want to go back and kind of get back to our roots. And I have a special guest who's not just a dating coach or relationship coach. He's an overall coach. And we don't do that too much 
recently on the show. So I want to get back there and get with one of the best. And so I've got Shana James. She's an MA for 20 years. She's coached more than a thousand men and women, leaders, CEOs, authors, speakers, and those with big visions who want to find love or rekindle spark, create a legacy, or even in business, become more effective, uh, be a leader, more personally inspired and fulfilled. She's got a master's in psychology, DISC certification. She does all kinds of workshops, works with men and women all over the US she, and the world. And she is located in San Francisco. And it is my pleasure uh, to bring back the great Shana James to Guys Guys Radio. She was back here in uh, 2015 was when we last spoke. Oh, really? That's when it was. Yeah. So welcome to the show, Shana. Thank you. Good to be back. Great. So let's talk about a little bit about, since it's Guys Guys Radio, about kind of helping men because um, men, I think, may need help. So do you think that men need help these days? And if so, how? That's a great question. I mean, I think the word help can be triggering for men, but I think we all need some help, you know, and I think men especially are taught that you should go it alone and, you know, shouldn't have any problems and, you know, that's just not a realistic view of life. I think that when I think about, a lot of people talk about this, you know, when you're an Olympic athlete or when you're the best of the best, people have coaches and support, right? To get better or to get more of what you want in life. And so I don't see it as like, oh, well, men need help more than women need help. I think we all could use some guidance and support. And I think you and I have talked about this, that maybe it was another conversation you know, most of us never got an education around how to communicate with each other, how to have emotional issues with each other, how to have sex with each other. Like we were left kind of high and dry. So I think, I think we could all use some help these days. Do you, do you think there's been a, a shift in expectations that women have about uh, what they want and expect out of guys? And yeah. has that created some type of confusion a little bit with men because you've got, yeah. of course, uh, women have been on a straight trajectory of uh, ascension and long overdue recognition. And then you've got the Me Too, which kind of has hit a lot of guys uh, mm -hmm. like a two by four. And a yeah. lot of it has been about, um, you know, listen, let's, let's really face it. Mm -hmm. Women have been underappreciated and mistreated for not just years or decades or centuries, but for thousands of years and it's just been wrong. And now things are changing quickly and they still have a lot, a lot more to go. But uh, with all of that said, men are in a position where it's a little bit confusing for them. They don't yeah. know kind of what hit them. And particularly, you know, when you get with things like me too, because not every guy is a powerful guy and not every guy is guilty of being mistreating right. women. And, 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 and a lot of guys get into that, you know, friend zone or that like, I'm a nice guy and that, that stinks. So what's your kind of, a lot of stuff I threw at you, but I know you'll yeah. know how to parse it out. Yeah. I mean, I was just writing about this this morning, right? You know, just because men as a whole have power doesn't mean that each man individually feels powerful. And just because a man feels powerful in one aspect of his life doesn't mean he feels powerful in all aspects of his life. So again, you know, sometimes I work with men who are really successful in business and yet they come home and they're either in a relationship that the passion's fading and they don't know how to get it back or they're single and they keep being seen, like you said, as the friend or the nice guy. So I do think, you know, you asked, I think women are having more expectations. And on the one hand, that can seem like it's a pain in the ass to be a man and have to step up in these different ways and be emotionally connected. And I used to just, you know, men used to just be more of the, the breadwinners and they would kind of go off. You were advertising. I think about uh, what's that show, that famous advertising show where the guys were. Um, Mad Men. You know, just, yeah, exactly. Like they're just, you know, you're off doing your work and having your whiskey and not having to necessarily show up in a certain way for women. And so in some ways it feels like we're all wanting more out of relationship. And I think when you see it in a way when you take the pressure off of it and you actually realize, oh, I can learn some skills and actually have more connection, more pleasure, more intimacy, a better sex life, right? It can become exciting when it doesn't feel like something you are, you should do or something where, you know, a lot of men bump up against some shame, like shame around sex or shame around emotions and vulnerability. And so when that hits, that's where I tend to usually work with men around those things. Okay, let, let's, let's touch on that because shame, um, what are men feeling shame about? 
A lot of men come to me when they're feeling shame about wanting something like wanting touch or wanting affection or wanting a better sex life. You know, that that's a big one that men come to me for. Why would that be shame though? Well, some men have been raised in a Christian Catholic sometimes Jewish, whatever, whatever the religion is, right? Sometimes it's religion, sometimes it's family systems. And either there was no conversation about sex or there was the conversation of don't have sex, you know, until you're married or it wasn't a conversation like, wow, sex and affection and intimacy is a part of our lives. Let's help you figure out how to grow up and navigate this realm. Like I said, most of us haven't gotten that education. So you know, then men feel shame on top of feeling shame. Like there's shame about being ashamed or shame about feeling vulnerable, you know? Um, Do you think that uh, men can kind of get stuck at times and it's hard for them to kind of let go of things and kind of explore new things? Yeah, I think that can be, that can happen. A lot of uh, what I see is that the fear of the emotional or relational terrain can be scarier than whitewater rafting or hella skiing. Or I see a lot of men who are like, "Yeah, I can, you know, I can go climb a mountain," and yet asking my partner if they're heterosexual, you know, if there's a relationship with women, it's like talking about our sex life or our intimacy or our sensuality or affection can be really terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, When you're getting into that, what is there? uh, I think for a lot of guys, they're probably saying to themselves, well, what what do I have to talk about it for? Yeah. Yeah. Let's just touch each other and do it and figure it out when we're kind of getting physical. Why do we need to discuss it? Because I need to talk about it. Yeah. A lot of guys don't want to chat about that. And I don't know if it's, I don't think it's about shame. I think they just like, they just uncomfortable. It's like, well, why do I need to talk about that? Let's just explore. Right. And, you know, there's a couple of different ways. I'm not to look saying at it. it's right or wrong. Yeah, you can just explore and that's fine. The one of the things I've found is that women have a hard time saying if they like something or don't like something, myself included, you know, for a long time, even still in my 40s and having done 20 to 25 years of spiritual work and emotional work and therapy and all kinds of stuff. It's still hard for me to say, I don't quite like that. Or could you try something else? Or could we do it this way? Right. And so if you're not talking about it at all, you don't Mm -hmm. necessarily know. And I think when men are in relationships where the passion is fading and they're like, "Ugh, well, I don't want to talk about it. I'm like, okay, well, you can keep going like it is or you could actually talk about it. You know, the definition of insanity, isn't it? Albert Einstein's definition of insanity is going along doing the same thing and hoping that something's just gonna be different. Right, right. And yeah. so the, I love conversations about sex, especially where either a debrief of like, what was great about that for you or what would you want differently next time? Now that can touch into shame too, because if you hear something that a woman doesn't enjoy, and you start to take it personally and feel like you're a bad lover or there's some issue with that, then it cuts off all of the play and exploration that can happen. Right. So. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, dating is supposed to be like a fun sport and relationships too. And sex also should have some joy in it. So I yeah. think if, you know, a lot of guys are going to be reticent about having like a post game discussion about, you know, what I liked and what I didn't like, because for a lot of guys, it's like, you know, let's put it this way. Guys have to perform, women and men have to perform, of course, during uh, during intimacy, but guys have a very special way, obvious way of performing, of course. And um, anything that gets into overthink is they, they might think that it could get in the way. So they don't want to really do a lot of thinking. They want to do more of a visceral reacting and responding and, mm-hmm. and, you know, that type of thing. So I guess in the post game I mean, discussion, as long as, as long as everybody's it feels good. I think most guys are going to be like, okay, if you want to tell me something, you want me to do more of this or that. And I can tell you that that's a, that's a real good thing. Yeah. It can be really fun. It can be really playful. It can be sexy, you know, especially when you keep it in the lens of what did you enjoy and what would you want more of instead of complaining or making something wrong. Right. Um, and, you know, I think the most ecstatic, expansive sexual states, I don't think you can really reach those without being 
in some way collaborating, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be just words. It could be, um, you know, a physical play or a, an energetic play, right? But without communicating about, well, you know, what do you like or what do you want to try or what are your fantasies? And we're, I'm just talking about the sexual realm because in some right. ways it's so concrete, it's easier to get it. Right. But then you can expand it into life, you know. What and a lot of people don't even talk about well, why are we in relationship together? It's like, oh, we, you know, we got together to have family and just because people do this and we want support and whatever, but there's so much more possible. Yeah. And a lot of the guys who come to me are deep thinkers and are actually like emotional and have this sensitivity and want more connection and intimacy. I think maybe a lot of times guys, uh, they don't want to, they don't want to talk themselves out of being in a relationship. If they get into like, why am I in this relationship? And then they start thinking of the, the negative. So Maybe, maybe that's something, but overall big picture. And then we can get into some more specifics on dating is, do you think, and again, my special guest is Shana James. Uh, she's got the Man Alive podcast and she is a coach of uh, relationships and business and personal development, et cetera. Do you think Shana that the uh, communication chasm between men and women ha- is widening or is it getting closer together now where people understand each other better? a great question. I have a, an answer that you may not like, but I think both, you know, I think about our, our society, especially in the United States with there's more division than ever, but there's also a lot of moving forward and evolving at the same time. And I think it's similar with communication between men and women. It's like, in some ways, a lot of people are getting to be more emotionally connected and feeling more understood and loved and welcomed and at the same time there are a lot of people who are unsatisfied especially in the romantic relationships now we're in the time of covid and before covid even occurred there was so much tech had really taken over how a lot of people are dating now whether it's the services you know match.com or bumble or whatever and now and all the apps now with covid a lot of people are using zoom and skype more and more um, what do you think that's going to do to uh, dating? Because, you know, there's something to be said for the old school uh, where you had to meet somebody you're like, hi, I'm Joe. Can I buy you a drink or something like that from 30 years ago? And, you know, nobody wants to talk to Mr. Whiskey Breath necessarily. But for a man, it, it, you had to put it out there. You had to introduce yourself. You had yeah. to kind of walk the line. And there was something about that where it said, I have to learn how to just step up and communicate with women. Now you've got a lot of these and you see it across the board. You've got a lot of these keyboard warriors, and uh, it, I think it may uh, limit them in terms of uh, being able to uh, build on interpersonal relationship skills. Thoughts? I have to say, when I was dating online, I now have a partner, but when I was dating online a bunch of years ago, I could actually feel, I, I can energetically feel people. You know, I mean, you know, you do a lot of deep work too, and you know that we're way more than we realize we are. Sure. And so I would get an energetic feeling from a man I saw online or from the words he wrote, and then I'd go meet him and it would be basically the same. So I don't think that it has to cut off anything. You know, I was actually talking to a woman the other day who said she met a guy on Zoom and then they went for a walk and it was really, really different than it had seemed on the computer. So, you know, I I still think you got to get together at some point in person and really see if that chemistry is there and if you feel each other, but there's an incredible opportunity to meet and get to know each other. And, you know, one of my clients recently started dating online and he said, he threw out a line to a woman, like she she reached out to him and he said, oh, well, let me know if you want to talk. And I said, when I was dating, I would bad, not bad. have gone for that. I would have just been like, eh, boring. Like there's nothing here for me that's inspiring to me. Exactly. You know? So again, there are ways that you can either inspire and create something beautiful or interesting. And then there are ways you can just kind of schluff it off. So how can women support guys who are kind of doing their best, uh, kind of, you know, cheer them on a little bit because obviously some guys are trying and then there's other guys who are angry about everything that's happened. Yeah. And uh, their anger is not helping things. I always tell guys, you, you know, your best, my best advice to you is listen, just listen. Yeah. This is a time for men to listen and learn. Um, but there's some guys that are, uh, that are kind of, uh, they're pissed off about everything. And they think it's like they're, they're paying a price for something they didn't do. But right. hey, you know what, you just have to 
this is a accumulation of uh, thousands of years. So a lot of things are happening quickly. You have to kind of just listen and hear out, hear out ladies and see what they have to say. doesn't mean the yeah. fingers being pointed at you personally, but, but it, with that said, how can well, women I, kind I, of uh, get guys to urgent kind of get them to, you know, com be more communicative? Yeah. Okay. So one thing I want to say is I make a lot of space for men who I'm working with to share their anger. Because if they've been divorced or they have a mother who was really suffocating or demanding or, and they're not ever talking about that anger, they're trying to build on top of this, you know, this foundation that mm -hmm. is right. a messy, right. And, and not stable. So I, you know, I do think it's important for us to listen for everybody to listen to the, the anger and the frustration. And sometimes I think it's great for men to take that to other men. Mm -hmm. and not be victimized by it, not, you know, complain about it, but like really, you know, if there's, if there's anger and frustration, then bring it and have it, you know, do it with someone else. Don't just stay alone in it because I think that's where there's a lot of suffering. And then it's like, okay, express the anger and, and then come to the women you meet without that sense of, she's trying to punish me or all women are all men, right. Are, right? It's like, we're all individual, unique people. So can we actually do what we need to do to clear the frustration and the hurt and the pain and come to people with an open slate right. or an open door? Yeah. Um, is there, are there advantages? A lot of guys who are like the nice guys complain about I'm in the friend zone. I don't know how to get out. Are yeah. there advantages of being in the friend zone? Cause everybody's been there you know, once or twice at, at least. And to me, it's not the, the worst place to be. I mean, you know where you stand. Uh, I don't know if there's a way out of the friend zone uh, because you can't make somebody fall in love oh, with you. I think there is a way. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, when I got married years ago and we're not married anymore, but when I got married, I knew this guy for two years as a friend before mm -hmm. I fell in love or whatever happened. And I talk about this moment where he walked into a cafe and I turned around and I looked at him and suddenly my body just completely lit up and I felt turned on in a way that I never had with him before. And what we realized eventually had happened is, you know, he'd done a lot of his own personal work. His father had passed away and he'd done a lot mm -hmm. of soul searching and he'd done a lot of embodiment practices. So instead of just being more like a walking head or or even just a walking heart, like nice guys tend to have access to their minds and access to their hearts, but not as much access to their sexual energy, their primal energy, feeling really good about it. And so oftentimes when I work, I work with most of the men I work with are nice guys and I just have so much love and respect for them. And as we start to open up like, oh, they can talk about sex and they can want things and they can you know, they don't have to hide it. They don't also have to dump it on someone, but they can actually collaborate about it. That moves them out of the friend zone. So I've had many, many men who were stuck in the friend zone. I have one client in particular who he was like, oh, I just, you know, I have to pick for, from which women are actually wanting me. And as we started working together for a couple of months, it completely turned around. He was overwhelmed by how many women were reaching out to him. And he said to me, it's one of my favorite things a man has ever said. He said, Sheena, I feel like I'm doing less than ever. And women are wanting me more than ever. Like I'm being more myself. I'm not putting on a game or proving anything. And Good. women are coming out of the woodwork. Well, learning how to receive, that's a, that's a big one too. So a big uh, one. the kind of big picture, um, what would be your uh, three bits of advice for guys going forward? Three bits of advice for guys. Okay. Let's say number one is get clear about what lights you up, what turns you on, what excites you, not just sexually, but you know, everything in life and make sure that those things are a part of your life that you're, you know, you're inspiring yourself. You would be inspired. Like, what is it that when people talk about, um, you know, be who you would want to date or be who you would want to, to have as a boss. Right. So really stepping into that uh, way of living. Um, another right. one I would say is know that there is so much happening beyond like beyond the surface, right? 
And if most of your interactions are intellectual and you're trying to really understand and you're trying to understand women and why is she doing that? And this is frustrating. Then you're missing, you know, from your neck down, you're missing all kinds of energetic and physical and emotional experiences that make life really interesting and exciting and mind blowing and ecstatic. And so start to tap into the other parts of yourself. All right. Okay, Shana James, our special guest on Guys Guys Radio. She's host of the Man Alive podcast. Uh, where can el- where else can people find you, Shana? Yeah, you can go to my website, shanajamescoaching.com. Shana is S-H-A-N-A. And if you go to shanajamescoaching.com slash three ways, the number three and the word ways, I have a guide there on three ways men lose influence at work and with women. Perfect. Okay. Well, Shana, you've proven once again that you don't have to be a guy to be a guy's guy. So thanks for being on Guys Guys Radio. All the best to you. And uh, it's been great. Thanks.